Welcome to the Community Environmental Council's webinar series. CEC was recognized as a 2020 California Nonprofit of the Year and Rapid and Equitable Solutions to the Climate Crisis. We just completed a five-year strategic plan and we are implementing it this year with foundational framework built around climate policy, justice, resilience, and leadership. Our leadership program is creating events like this to build a base of climate knowledge that we hope inspires you to action. We're also providing opportunities to increase your knowledge of climate science, like our UC Climate Stewards class. Our next session starts next week, July 7th, and registration will be open until this Friday, and we do still have a few spots available. It's on our website if you're interested. Maybe someone could put that in the chat as well. We are also bringing you events like this one designed to build emotional connections to what we love about our local environment. Art can provide another lens for us to connect with climate change and maybe even our collective anxiety and grief about the changing climate. We look forward to discussing that and more with today's guests. First, we have a few housekeeping items. You may have noticed this webinar is being recorded. You will receive a link to the recording and other resources later this week um, in case you want to share that with people that you know. This is an active session and your engagement is very welcome. We invite you to add questions to the Q&A box during the discussions and we will answer them as we are able to during the presentation and live Q&A section at the end. We apologize in advance if we're not able to respond to every question. Please use the chat for other comments you may have or resources that you want to share. We have a support team here to help, including Iris, who you will see as one of our panelists, who is our Zoom whiz technician, uh, managing all of the behind the scenes tech, and also Sarah from our communications team who is um, participating in the chat. Um, we're gonna keep everyone's video off. Uh, our, we have a large, large group of panelists today, so we're gonna keep their video off unless speaking. And now, uh, oh, where's the poll? Sorry, I didn't mention the poll. Uh, will, will you, um, if you see the poll, will you um, answer those two questions we have for you about how you heard about today's event and where you are joining us from today? I know that some of you put that in the chat, but it helps us to have that data all collected together. And Iris, just let me know when you are closing. Is it closed? Okay, thank you for taking the poll. I guess we've closed it for now. All right, we're gonna move on and introduce our first guests. Sarah Dildine, Exhibitions Manager from the Museum of Contemporary Art, Santa Barbara. Sandra Terry, the Chief Curator from, also from the Museum of Contemporary Art, Santa We collaborated earlier this year on the Earth Day mural um, at their facility at Pase Nuevo, which I highly encourage visit if you haven't yet seen it. Um, so Alex, can't see Alex. Are you there? <laughs> oh, I'm on speaker view. I need to go to. Oh. Hello. Hello. Welcome. <laughs> there you are. There you are. <laughs> Wrong view on. <laughs> I can see anything. <laughs> nice to see you both together at work. Um, yeah. So, Alex, um, can you talk a little bit about how the project came about and why it was important to the MCA Santa Barbara? Absolutely. I had to go back into my email and kind of dig into the timeline a little bit, but basically Kathy reached out to us. It was autumn 2020 and our first meeting was around October 2020. And I remember Laura Macker Johnson, our current CEO and board president, and you and I met um, in the room that we're in right now. And you just pitched us the idea of working together. And of course we knew immediately without hesitation that we wanted to um, come up with something that we could do together that was fun, that would support the local community. And of course the work that CEC has been doing is so important to us as an institution and to our community. So uh, there was no hesitation whatsoever. And it was during the pandemic at a time when we were really thinking, how can we support our local artist community, but also create something in person, physically, that we could safely share. And so really the brainstorming started during that meeting and, and we immediately thought that it would be really important to provide an opportunity for all of the Santa Barbara County artists and 
we thought up the um, open call that we held on our website. Yeah, and that was just something that we had at CEC had no experience with. So it was, you know, your expertise that really guided the process from there. And then you brought on partners, which was really key, particularly Paseo Nuevo, since it was on their building at their facility and also their amazing team of, of Danielle and Mary Lynn really guided us through the marketing process and um, just helping, you know, clear. We didn't have to go through a, a significant permit process. Um, which you can do if you are on other types of properties. So that helped a lot because we had a pretty ambitious timeline, right? Even for something <laughs> like <Yeah>. that. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty typical of the Museum of Contemporary Santa Barbara. It's like we're always thinking of what can we do next and let and we get so excited, like, let's do it. I Sarah's my first port of call, like, can we physically do this in this enough time? But I think you're right, Kathy, bringing the partners on was, was key. And it was important for us that if, if this is going to be a community project, that really we tapped into our friends, our partners, our resources in the community, spread the call as widely as we could. That was a big part of why we wanted to work with the Arts Fund because of their amazing connection with the local artist community. And we worked with um, B Cycle. You know, I had I met with Jesse a couple months before you and I met, I believe. And I just knew that, you know, I really wanted to bring attention to this new initiative, this um, e bike uh, program mm -hmm. in Santa Barbara, and just find a way that we could all get together and support each other. So, and then as you said, um, the mural is on the backside of the museum, which is the upper level of the Paseo Nuevo uh, parking deck. So bringing Paseo Nuevo on as a partner, Mary Lynn and Danielle always, I mean, Paseo Nuevo and Pacific Retail support the museum in incredible ways. So it was sort of a no, no brainer. And I think we all supported each other in ways that were crucial to the project. Yeah, absolutely. And and just in terms of the open call, we had we had quite a few submissions that were really impressive. We had a hard time making that choice with the with the selection committee. Is that typical um, from what you've done in the other types of projects like that you've done? And do you think that having, you know, Earth Day and the climate change um, sort of subtext of the um, theme of it uh, was something that resonated with the artists? Yeah, I think just on the, the aspect of whether or not that's typical for us, that was actually Alexandra and my, for our time here, it was our first time doing a call for artists. So we were also seeing, you know, we were so excited to get 27 submissions. It was really difficult with all the conversations that we had with our partners, trying to figure out who, who's the, the correct person to select here, who would be the best for our community. Um, so we had created that this large rubric, um, me being obsessed with spreadsheets. Um, we, we had a, a really good system to try to figure that out and really do, do justice to making sure that we're finding a good piece for this wall. Yeah, and I think, I hope everyone agrees that we absolutely did. And we're looking forward to hearing the artist's perspective on that. Um, as we as we go today, but um, you were about to say something, Alex. I, I was going to say we also invited two community partners that are artists, and that was really important for us to make sure that we were hearing the voice of the community, and they were friends of the museum, friends of other partners, and that was important because you know you when you start a project like this, you kind of it's easy to project the vision that you hold for it, but that doesn't mean that that's the vision for the community or the vision for, you know, people who are passing by it every day. So it was really important for us to have artists and um, one of the um, community members, Arturo Soto is, is the lead preparator for our museum, but also someone who has extensive experience working with murals in Mexico and Mexico City with Diego Rivera murals. So we were like, this is the person that's gonna give us some great feedback. And Maria Rondon, who is on our board, is an artist that actually is in an exhibition at the Wildling, I'm sure Stacy will mention later. But it was just, it was fun. And as Sarah said, to have 27 applicants was amazing. We had no idea really what we were going to receive. It was so exciting. And it was just so fun too to be able to work 
with the community in that way and to go through and see you know what what the amazing submissions that people created were yeah and the community really turned out during the process which we will talk about when we when we talk to adriana and, and claudia um, but i just wanted to to ask you one last question before we we get to the artist which is um you know how how did this maybe it feels like both of you already have a very strong you know advocates of putting climate change out there through art and did this you know sort of um solidify that position in your minds and and do you have um plans to continue that going forward and and you've talked about other environmental initiatives that you want to do with the museum so is this sort of a did this help get that ball rolling with you or 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 just you know, confirm we, that you wanted to do that it ha we really have a history of using our exhibition program and our engagement program to highlight our institution's concerns with environmental issues and uh social justice. There was an amazing exhibition curated in 2016, 2016 by Brooke Kellaway at the museum called Beyond Two Degrees, which had a beautiful, uh, you know, program that went along with it. So this was definitely another piece of the puzzle of, of what the museum is really concerned with. And we absolutely have plans. Stacy will talk further about um, the uh, environmental alliance that the museum will be taking part in. So we have exhibitions planned, we have a conference plan, and it is at the forefront of everything we do and how we think about exhibitions, how we install our work, how we, I mean- Recycle materials. Yeah. yeah it's, it's definitely part of our everyday procedures here too. Tom, well, wonderful. It's great to see you both. If you can't tell as you're watching, we, we really enjoyed working together. Um, I was just incredibly impressed with with all of your knowledge of art, but also as the mural was being created, you know, they, Sarah particularly was out there with a paintbrush <laughs> for a lot of that time. So it was just a, a wonderful process to, for us as a you know nonprofit that doesn't usually work in this space to really um, see it from the ground up, so to speak. Um, it was just great. So well, thank you for thank the you. opportunity. It was such a pleasure and really an honor to work with CEC and we're grateful that you wanted to work with us. Wow, more to come, I am sure. So thank you both. Um, and now I'm going to introduce you to the artists that you have already heard so much about um, that, that were the ones that were chosen out of that very strong field to um, create this amazing piece of art on a humongous wall. Um, Adriana Ariaga and Claudia Borfiga. They're both local um, and uh, they applied as a team and, uh, and were selected as a team. And this was the first mural experience that they both had, which is uh, saying a lot considering the size and scale of that piece. Um, so um, Adriana, let's start with you. What, what motivated you or, or you and Claudia as that team to, to respond to the open call? Yeah, so Claudia and I met um, in this group called Friends of Public Art. And I remember one of the members, Freddie Janka, who I'm sure a lot of us know who is, um, had sent us the call for the mural proposal. And Claudia reached out to me and she was like, hey, do you want to partner and send the proposal in? And I was like, yeah, let's do it. And I feel like though Claudia and I, we do have, we work in different mediums. Um, we definitely create bold images using color. And I think your style of printmaking and my vector, digital vector work, definitely complement each other. And it just helped us create this, you know, beautiful mural with really significant imagery and combines like these natural and human elements. Great, thank you, Claudia. Do you have anything to add to that about your motivation? Yeah, I mean, I, I um, was getting to know Adriana and thought it was a great opportunity to collaborate with her and it was, you know, I hadn't really realized how easy it would be for us to work together, I think, because of that color and image styling. But um, I just thought it'd be a great balance of, like Adriana creates these uh, like, like Chicano inspired um, human elements a lot of the time, whereas I'm normally more nature focused. And so I knew that something where well, we're talking about earth 
I was like, oh, we got to have the nature bit, but the human component's going to be really important. So I thought that we needed to collaborate because of that front as well. Yeah, and both of those themes really come out in the piece. So you successfully merged your styles in a beautiful way. Did this, have you, have you used art prior in terms of amplifying a movement, whether it's a social justice movement or environmental justice movement like this um, in your art before? And, and, and do you think you would continue going forward as, as this inspired you to do that more? Uh, yeah, definitely. My I think just the beginning of my graphic design career has definitely always emphasized ethics. And during my um, when I was getting my MFA in design, my thesis centered around contemporary Chicano graphic design and how the poster is used to build community. And and I think that's just kind of like what my work is based off of. It's just an extension of of myself. And um, but I think just the mural just really helped me make that in a very much larger scale with a larger audience and it it just kind of encouraged me to find different ways to connect with people um besides just you know printing posters and handing them out um, but yeah wonderful Claudia do you have anything to add to that yeah I think um it just uh I don't know over time I found myself drawn more and more to community-based projects. I, you know, I have my own studio practice as well, but it doesn't fill me up in the same way that like collaborating and working with other people does. Um, and then, yeah, it just being like Amplify, I think is a good word for it. It's that um, in some ways, like creativity or art is way more approachable than uh, hard facts and science and you know things that make people fearful that maybe can be a deterrent for them getting involved in issues as opposed to feeling included and connected and I think creativity is a really good way to bring people together um I'm biased about that but <laughs> I think it does a good job I think it can be really fun to yeah, yeah, I agree. And then it could be an entry point, you know, it, the charts mm -hmm. and graphs don't always do the trick. I mean, we do need the charts and graphs once people want to get more, you know, build their knowledge. But I think an, an entry point that connects emotionally is not a chart or a graph. It's more of like what you created. We have some slides. Um, if you want to put those up, um, uh, Iris is going to share slides that to just show the process a little bit. And if you want to provide any narration for just what this felt like. I think that's our, is that Arturo there on the, uh, he was on the scissor lift a lot of the time. Um, mm -hmm. What this, what this was like. Oh, it was so much fun. <laughs> um, I had wanted to do a mural for a really long time and then getting to do it on a wall that was like 64 feet by 17 feet was like a really big entry point for it. Um, and Adriana and I designed it in a way so that you can see that we have these big solid blocks of color and thinking about like, hey, if we apply it in this way, we can invite volunteers from the community to come and paint alongside us and like keeping that community element attached to the project was really important to both of us. And you did, if I recall, there were a lot of community members that came out with the paintbrushes. Do you want to share any fun stories about that <laughs> but it was just really nice it was like you know a mix of my friends and adriana's and then other people from the community that we knew and the mta had um, their own set of volunteers and it just was a nice atmosphere with like snacks um and music and but you know people weren't experts in painting at all it was just you know, anyone who could hold a paintbrush was welcome to come and join us. Um, yeah, yeah the design really lent itself to that, which I think is what, you know, attracted the, the selection committee as well, that, you know, the timeline, as we mentioned, was was pretty ambitious, so that uh, that you were able to complete this in that amount of time in, this, in and of itself is is quite amazing, and that, that you came up with, you know, something this 
beautiful and 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 uh, you know that will have that has a long lasting impact. And do you want to? We have the slide up now. The the full mural. Is there anything in particular, Adriana, that you want to call out about um, the images and what they mean to you and how that related back to the theme of of the nurture or mother theme that you created? Yeah, I think our one of the biggest uh, messages we wanted our mural to kind of just amplify was that we needed each other. We need each other to protect the earth. And I think the way Claudia and I approached it was, you know, grabbing elements that were familiar to Santa Barbara, so something very local, but at the same time using these like human elements. And I think for me, you know, it, it was a portrait of Mother Earth that does stand out for me the most because you know, that's, that's very much what I do. I do a lot of portraits, especially of women and women of color, and especially of women who are out in the community doing a lot of work, you know, to, to protect the community as well as the earth. And I wanted to kind of just embody what that meant for me and, and other community members. Um, and just, you know, even to her skin color, just being brown and rich, um, you know, just thinking about the earth and, you know, she's breastfeeding a baby and just kind of that connection like just breastfeeding is like one of the most natural things that we've you know somehow all experienced um and just you know cre creating this kind of like crown around her using poppies and you know really just it, it was a way to really just say thank you to the indigenous women in my life who've taught me a lot about protecting the earth and who are still teaching a lot of us about protecting the earth um, and how we have to protect um, the indigenous community. And so definitely um, that's, you know, the fact that I, I work in a lot of digital illustrations and I have like a lot of, you know, fine lines and stuff. So the fact that I was able to get help with, you know, displaying that on such a large scale and just seeing people, just their reaction and how much they enjoyed it. And just, just all the symbolism that that's just in that single portrait. And then, you know, combining with all the other symbolism in the mural, um, I think it's it's just an amazing balance of of what we that we needed we need each other and even just the grid itself you know if if you remove one of the pieces it's going to look empty and I think again that further just emphasizes that we all need each other um, to to make sure that we're doing the work that we need to do. Definitely, I think that's what what really spoke to the selection committee as well that you have you know basically from the soil to the humans that get nurtured by it, um, it, it really, and it, and that all of these elements are local too. You know, it's not a polar bear, which we care about polar bears, but we don't have any polar bears in Santa Barbara. So uh, it's, it's wonderful to have the, the images close to home, so to speak. And, and if you haven't gone out there and taken pictures of it, the, the poppies are my home screen on my phone. So every time I look at my phone, <laughs> I have a bit of the mural with me all the time, but uh, it's still just much, you know, it, it is also pretty incredible to see in person at the size and scale. So um, um, before we uh, move on, I just wanted to ask Claudia if you had anything to add to, uh, to what Adriana just said about, uh, you know, just the imagery. Yeah, I think, um... As someone who didn't grow up here but has lived here for the past uh, four years, I kind of really, you know, I moved here from London, so it's a really different um, environment. And part of the joy of living here has been the discovery of that environment. Um, my my dad is a is in love with toads and frogs, and so in particular, the arroyo toad that's in the bottom of my fountain water means a lot to me. Uh, to get to paint a toad that's like the size of my parents' living room wall um, <laughs> on the side of a building in public is great joy. And that's a endemic uh, to California species that is endangered due to habitat destruction. And so, you know, everything, there's lots of ourselves in this mural, but also hopefully a lot that everyone can connect with, like you connecting with the California poppies. Um, so yeah. Lots to lots to celebrate about our uh, earth, um, but lots to look after for the future. Well, that's a beautiful note to to close out this part of the discussion on. Thank you both so much for, for all of your efforts, and um, you know, it's just 
just a wonderful community asset that you have created. We are Thank you. forever in your debt for that. So <laughs> more, more, more soon, I'm gonna move on now um, to our next guest, Stacy Adi Demangate, who is the executive director of the Wildling Museum of Art and Nature in Solvang. CEC recently partnered with the Wildling Museum for the Earth Day Poetry Contest. That was another really beautiful example of connecting art and climate and the winning poems were incredibly moving. Um, and there's an upcoming museum collaboration that you heard Alex mention a little while ago that's very exciting for the entire region relating to this climate and art conversation. So we're, we have a lot we can cover with Stacy, but I wanna start there. Um, it's called an Environmental Alliance. Um, so I will let you, you know more about it than I do, so I won't summarize anymore. I'll just let you tell us what that is. Great. Um, thank you for inviting me and letting me um, bring some awareness to this. And first of all, congrats to that awesome collaboration with the mural. It's wonderful. It's exciting to see something so modern but nature-based um, like that on display down there. So I can't wait to see it in person. Um, so I guess to backtrack on, you know, what is the Environmental Alliance of Santa Barbara County Museums, because that's a pretty new thing, I was realizing that, you know, really it was kind of an outgrowth of COVID. So there were good things that came out of COVID time, as I like to think of it, um, because it was a time where we all had to kind of stop a lot of normal activity. And uh, one thing that we as the museums in uh, throughout the county did was we checked in with each other a lot. I think we started meeting by Zoom, maybe it was even weekly for a while and it's kind of slowed down over as the months have enrolled, but it really brought us together because we needed each other to understand the new environment that the whole world obviously was operating in. Um, and of course, as you start to get to know everybody better and work together more on different things, ideas you know, percolate up. And I honestly am not entirely sure who this idea was. Um, climate change concerns are a personal big concern of mine. And so um, I certainly am an advocate for it. And so the idea came about that, what about many of us who ever wanted to, you know, coming together over this issue, what could we do and would we want to? And it evolved into 12 of us really uh, connecting with it and wanting to do a collaborative project, um, which we ended up deciding would be in 2022. Um, in that process, we also kind of came to terms with our own group that was focused on this. And so we ended up terming ourselves the Environmental Alliance of Santa Barbara County Museums. And I think our long-term goal is that um, it won't just be the one project around climate change, but that we'll be encouraging each other and anyone else that wants to, you know, join over time to further our own uh, green sustainability efforts and our own institutions and public education thereof. So um, I didn't want to read the list, 13 names, um, but uh, they're there on your screen for you. And um, hopefully you see the uh, incredible diversity that we all represent. Um, you know, yes, we're art here at the Wildling Museum of Art and Nature. Um, we've been hearing from Alex um, over at MCA and you can see all the others that are involved too. But I think it's even more important that some of the less obvious partners are excited and involved as well. Um, meaning like the Trust for Historic Preservation or the Maritime Museum, um, you wouldn't necessarily expect, especially the old mission. I was so excited that they really did want to uh, join us. And I think there's gonna be a lot of power in, because we are so different, we can tackle the subject in lots of um, different ways. Um, so the, to sum it up a little better, um, we ended up deciding that the project would be called Impact Climate Change and the Urgency of Now. And I will say that took a little bit of time for all of us to coalesce around a title. Um, when you have this many partners, it does take a lot of discussion to, uh, you know, have things come together and uh, find agreement on. And I think we all agree that was kind of a really good title for what we all wanted to impart for next year. 
Um, the bulk of it for all of us will be uh, around April 2022 with a big launching effort at Earth Day. And we've been talking with Kathy and CEC who are uh, kind of partnering with us and letting us have a presence there. And then um, probably ending in, in around September 2022, there may be some folks that come in a little later or stay a little later, but the bulk of it will um, happen there. Um, and as Alex said, some folks are focused more on like a conference public presentation and others of us are really focused on the, the exhibitions that we'll um, have at our institutions. Um, but we're really excited that with so many of us joining together, it's, I think that in of itself is a great message to the community that, you know, here are trusted institutions and, you know, museums are thought of as one of the most trustworthy sources of information. Um, that here we're all saying the same thing, that climate change is here, it's now, it's real, and there is urgency around tackling this complicated thing in ways that all of us can, can make efforts. Beautiful, wonderful. I love the title, you know, urgency is, needs to be part of the message um, and it, it isn't always. Um, so it's, it's great to see that, especially as you said, coming not only from trusted institutions, but from institutions that you may, we may not have heard that from before. Um, so we are, we are, thank you for including us in this process and we are excited to have this be, I think, you know, we're talking about even building the theme of Earth Day 22, of 2022 around this because um, it is so important. And, and as we, we touched on with Alex, you know, it, it can be like a, 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 an emotional entry point for people, but one that, that meets them where they are willing to use their emotions rather than to be fearful or anxious um, about climate. And I think you have, a, um, you have an exhibit or two um, going on. I think we have a slide for that as well. Um, if you want to talk about that, the things that you're already doing um, around this topic. Actually, this, the slide for this is what we're planning on here at the Wilding for the climate change oh, okay. show. But of course, um, we are art and nature 24-7. Uh, so we do have a lot of art here right now that would it, at least in some way touch on, if not climate change, um, the environment, because that's who we are at heart. But a um, little sneak peek into what um, the Wildling um, is working on plans for in 2022. So uh, we uh, have confirmed that we're working with Ethan Turpin for um, a video installation. You know, he's done many of these amazing uh, burn cycle project installations and mm -hmm. some new techniques as well. So we're working with him on what that'll look like for us here at the Wildling. And then there's uh, an amazing ice uh, video that's a circumnavigation of um, icebergs that Zariah Foreman, who's amazing, sorry, that's Zariah with an I, not just Zara <laughs> on the slide. Um, that's incredible. And um, we just really feel that these different artists that we're starting to find and work with and confirm, um, I think will speak to different elements of both extremes of climate change, which is why we kind of picked fire and ice. They're so dramatically different kinds of things um, and uh, dramatic and appealing aesthetically, of course, but then, you know, things that you, we have to really think about. And um, we all know we're braced for quite a fire season again um, this year, Never mind what's already happening up north. So um, we're, it's, it's very exciting. We're thrilled with the show that we're working on here at The Wildling. And um, I can't really speak to all the different shows that everybody is individually working on because everybody's kind of on their own time frame for planning 2022, but we know it's gonna be amazing. Yeah, wow, I didn't, is, is that typical to plan that far out? I'm, I'm just learning oh. about how museums <laughs> function uh, from the inside. And I didn't realize that, that you, yeah. you were planned for a year out, basically. Oh, this is short. So, and actually we've been talking about this for longer than the year, but um, yeah, often, and often the bigger you are, the longer range, you know, your efforts are, but you could easily be planning shows out two to three years, which is kind of our, 
at least conceptually, we know it's going to come up for the next two to three years. And then you, as time gets closer, you really start nailing down all the, the details. Wow, oh, interesting. Well, it's, thank you for sharing that preview and the, the slides look uh, really dramatic and like something that I, I think I would definitely want to go see. So excited about all of these exhibits coming up in the next year. Um, and so you have also, um, not only are you doing some climate focused art and you, we did the poetry contest together mm -hmm. um, at Earth Day, but you um, have done sustainability work on your facility itself. Do you want to talk a little bit about what you've done um, at your at the museum building? Yeah, absolutely. And and I will say it's, you know, I really take our mission to heart, which um, is all about, you know, using art to bring awareness to nature and environmental issues and wildlife conservation. Um, but that to me, it has always meant that we should operate as, you know, green as we can. And um, certainly budget and time are always an issue because we're a really tiny operation. We only have three full-time staff um, and keep a super busy calendar of programs. But when we, we moved from Los Olivos, um, which some people may remember and know, and moved into Solvang, and that was happening in 2012 and 2013. And we were building out our space here in Solvang. And I knew that was an opportunity to try and bring in as many, I guess I would say green features, you know, as possible. And thankfully we had a contractor, Jim Belsitas, who was also very sensitive to this and wanting to work with us on this. So we did as much as we could during that process, which included like, I would say 95% of our lighting is all LED. Um, and that, which also happened to be good for the art because it doesn't put out the kind of light waves you don't want on art. Um, but so when, when? You know, it really keeps the, um, you know, the heat down, it puts out heat, other light kind of puts out heat, this doesn't. So there's just a million reasons why going LED is the way to go. Um, and then we did little things like we put in a waterless men's urinal, which is not something I talk about a lot for obvious reasons, but you know, over time as you have people using your public bathrooms that can really, you know, make a difference. Um, one of our staff at the time had the thought to, can we get a water bottle refiller, not just a normal watering station, but the, including that. And uh, so we did spend, you know, that little bit more money and put that in. So that gave us a, a little step forward with the green business program. Um, it did take us a while to go through actually uh, getting certified as a green business. And that was mostly on our end, just being taxed with a lot and uh, having a lot of time commitments in different areas. But eventually in 2017, we were certified as a green business and we're super proud of that. Um, and you know, when you go through that process that, um, you know, that you want to, you have to get recertified every three years. And in order to do that, you have to kind of show improvements. You have to do more. You can't just maintain what you've already done. And so I was very aware of that. And um, I can't remember exactly when I heard about the CEC Solarized Nonprofit Program, but kudos to you guys um, for offering that. And as soon as I saw it, I emailed, um, I think it was April, and just was like, wait, wait, how does this happen? Does this work for North County? What can we do? How does this work? And um, uh, she said, yeah, you could totally qualify. And then we, it just took time to kind of go through that. There was a lot of vetting with our board to figure out how this would work. Um, but because the program is so amazing, we didn't have to put out the tens of thousands of dollars to do all solar, you know, panels on our roof, um, because basically you sort of slowly pay for them. And then in our case, in somewhere between six and seven years, depending on how much sunshine there is, we will own the panels outright. Um, and in the meantime, we're barely paying any more than we would have already paid um, for our utility bills. Wow, that's so, great to hear the details of that. You know, we we have I think we've done six or seven solarized nonprofit mm -hmm. projects now, including the Sea Center. If you're out at the at the wharf and you see all those solar panels on the Sea Center in Santa Barbara, that's part that was a, one of our uh, nonprofit programs. But I, I 
you've, you've enlightened me even I worked there <laughs> I didn't know that uh, that you were going to get to own them after uh, over time so yeah uh, yeah it's it's a great program for for nonprofits that own your own business so if you're a, a, yeah. at a nonprofit I mean that own your own building so if you're a nonprofit that owns your building um, that is uh, something we can potentially help you with um, yeah, it it was incredible. So we we finally went live with, in November. So we're we've been experiencing you know the billing, and we just are so excited to be capturing the sun's energy in a productive way. So I'm really grateful for that. And then um, the other aspect is we focused on creating an actual green sustainability policy that um, we took to the board and that they. Uh, decided to implement. So that is uh, findable on our website. I think it's under uh, uh, our About Us tab if anyone wants to look at any details about it. But, you know, it's it's easy for a staff person to have a lot of impact while they're there. And then sometimes things shift a lot, you know, when that person is gone, if they're the primary driver. And so I was kind of conscious of wanting to, the whole board, the whole institution itself to say, no, this is part of absolutely who we are and how we do business. Um, so I did a lot of research and finding other kinds of policies that other uh, nonprofits and groups have done and kind of cobbled together what made sense for us and our kind of institution. And they board approved that uh, earlier in the year. And I'm very um, excited about that, that, you know, we have that in place that we are committed to keep going with the California Green Business Program, which uh, we're so grateful for their existence. And by the way, if anyone listening is like, I wonder if my business should do it, just talk to Fran at the county, you know, Green Business Program, and she's fantastic to work with. Her whole team is, and um, there's nothing to be, you know, nervous about or stressed out about because they will help you walk through the whole thing. They are really trying to help people get there. And you learn so much by going through the process too, I have to say. Yeah, Fran is terrific. And and also just, I think what you've done with your board sustainability policy, not only institutionalizes that, you know, mindset, but also will that help you, do you think be able to meet those three year incremental commitments to the green business program? Because now you have it basically, you know, codified as part of what you do. Was that yeah. sort of some of your thinking around that as well? Yeah, I think so, because it's in front of us all the time, you know, that, okay, and there's always more you can do. And that's something I've had to, you know, calm myself down sometimes because, you know, the goals can be very high and very lofty. And um, we were talking about, uh, you know, the plastic film and what can you do with plastic film? And there's a company down in Santa Barbara that's collecting it. And but not up here in North County. And now I'm immediately like, oh, who can we work with to try and figure out someone to help us get a baler so we can help be a collection point to save plastic from the environment. Um, yeah. We'll talk more about, I'll, I'll yeah. be happy to talk <laughs> offline. That. Or we, there's a subcommittee of the Green Business Program that's kind of working on that. So maybe, maybe it's time to bring you in on that, Stacey. Yeah, hey, uh, I, use we, your energy. <laughs> we'd love to help. But my point is that there's always more that you can do and um, don't get overwhelmed by it if you're wanting to get more involved and just do what you can do, but just keep keep moving forward, you know, every year. It helps. Exactly. Exactly. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much, Stacey. It's great to have set up the ship with you and I look forward to keeping it going. Um, and now we're going to go to our something new for us for webinars, which is a lightning round. So we're going to bring back all of the um, panelists that you've already heard from today. And we're going to just zip around and ask them a few questions that they're going to answer in one or two sentences. And I think we'll just go in alphabetical order. So sorry, Adrienne, I'm sure that always happens to you. She gets to go first, followed by Claudia, then Sarah, then Alex, then Stacy, then Alex. Yes, I, I can do the alphabet. Um, so <laughs> the first question is, what is your favorite personal eco habit? Ready, set, go. Um, this is gonna sound weird, but using like plastic bags as like other things. But yeah. <laughs> um, mine is composting. Home composting for the wind. Wonderful. Nice. I don't do this yet, but I really want to start making my own soaps and uh, personal products. Nice. 
So, uh, so my little thing that I do is uh, shampoo bars. I'm like committed to shampoo bars and no more plastic bottles in my shower. <laughs> right. Alex? I do my best to pick up rubbish on the beach when I'm walking around. Mm. Fabulous. Those are all inspiring and I want to do them all myself too. Um, next one, we're going to go back to the art theme here. Who is your favorite artist? And I know this is probably a hard one to choose, but if you have one, who's your favorite artist and, and why? Me? I'm just kidding. Um, my <laughs> name is Melanie Cervantes and Emery Douglas. I actually met Melanie Cervantes once in an event when I was in college. I remember I was like freaking out because she's amazing. She, she Oh, her portraits and just the so screening that she does they're just phenomenal so I got to meet her and I got to talk to her and it was amazing and I got a picture and I just had like the biggest smile on my face because it was definitely a life-changing moment um but yeah I would say that them too boy that's a big one and if you um have a chance to put that in the chat or somewhere we'll include a, a link to her work in our um in our resources section Claudia um this question gives me so much anxiety because I like want to say every local community artist um and then I also I just have too many and it's ever changing I'm skipping that's <laughs> totally fair <laughs> Claudia I share that anxiety as well I usually go with Lucia Hurtado who is just amazing um and she she passed a couple of years ago but I love her use of uh, the body and um and also kind of making it look like landscape. It's really beautiful. Thank you. Well, like Claudia, there's so many local artists I admire that I can't even pick. So I'm skipping local and going to Andy Goldsworthy who does these incredible art installations out in nature of natural materials and they don't last very long and they're just stunning. And I would die to be able to bring him here locally. <laughs> Go off. Um, I have to say my mother, Yasmin Esfandiari, um, my, I owe my entire artistic career to her and I first figured out what curatorial work was, um, helping her with her work and installing shows. That's beautiful. Well, thank you for that. And it was a hard question. Um, and finally, um, what gives you hope for the future? And I guess in the context of of climate change, but also just in general, what gives you hope for the future? I think just seeing the movement, you know, continuing and seeing how we are all working together um, and just protecting each other and the earth and just being able to see that and connect with people across different communities, I think gives me hope. Um, yeah. I think, um, uh, community gardens and allotments. My um, uh, my nonna had an allotment growing up, and like I don't know, just that kind of community growing together. I feel like is a really good way to get kids in all the way up to seniors, and I think it's a great place for good ideas and conversation and growing. Um. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think that the youth right now is just really inspiring. The, the high school students that I meet and those who are just, they're so active and um, to me just energizes me and I get really excited. So that gives me a lot of hope. Yeah, I'll have to second Sarah's the youth and uh, which we just hope to get more activated and involved with here at the Wilding, but um, also just collaborations in general because everything in the world is interconnected and I think collaborations are just kind of an example of that we can't, no one can do it alone so we have to be able to collaborate absolutely I am super inspired by folks who are doing food justice work and working with local mm -hmm. growers sort of like what Claudia was saying um you know allotments and community farms that are working with biodiverse, um, you know, goals and supporting individuals who need the resource of, of healthy and clean food. Right. Well, I would, I would say that our first lightning round was a huge success. <laughs> Thank you all for putting so much thought into your, into your responses and really giving us a lot to think about. Um, and thank you all so much for everything you're doing and for participating today. It was really, really fun.
Um, and we have one more guest um, that we are going to let do an announcement um, in a moment. It's um, for another collaboration um, that CEC is involved with, and that is with the um, group SCAPE, um, Southern California Artists Painting for the Environment, and they collaborate with nonprofits. And their show in October is a benefit for several groups in town. So I would like to introduce Bonnie Freeman to tell us more about the upcoming SCAPE show. Thank, hey, thank you so much, Kathy, and uh, everyone. It was really exciting to hear everybody's uh, talk today and gain, gain, gain more information. Um, I'm uh, the the, um, the um, coordinator. I'm an organizer, actually, uh, for the Scape Art Organization uh, that stands for Southern California Artists painting for the environment. I've always been involved in environmental issues in my whole life. When I moved here into O2, I signed up a couple of weeks later for the Los Olivos Wildling uh, Museum. <laughs> and uh, so it was really nice hearing uh, from everybody. Uh, so I'm beneficiary uh, uh, coordinator uh, for the art group. And our show is October 23rd and 24th of October. This is a year past the time that we were going to have our show. So we were lucky to hold on to our venue, which is going to be at the downtown uh, call, the community arts wor uh, workshop. And it's, we have uh, rented the entire venue. So we're going to have two large buildings. One side are all the artists and the paintings up on panels. We have our own panels and lighting. And the other side will be with our partners CEC, the Sierra Club, Los Padres chapter, uh, and the Climate Reality Project. They're, the Climate Reality Project is the Al Gore movement, and it's not a beneficiary of this because that's not in their, you know, uh, they're, they're not able to do that. They're providing a tremendous amount of educational materials, uh, and combined with the uh, CEC and Sierra Club, there will also be a video, speeches, uh, maybe some children's projects. We'll have music. We're going to have, um, uh, uh, you Can know. You talk, um, it's, it's gonna be, I think, really fun. And that, that community arts workshop is, a, is an incredible venue if you haven't been there. I think that, that Solstice used to use it to build floats. Um, and, and is the emphasis that you're putting out to the artists in terms of what they um, what, what they include, what, what is included in the show, is that going to have a, a climate change kind of theme to it? Yes, I'm glad you're making me get to that sooner than I would have. <laughs> yes, that's been kind of my focus for the past year. Every month I send out uh, updates to the artists that we have over 125 in, in the escape group. And I try to think of some way to inspire or have them be inspired, uh, not only educationally about what our partners are doing and providing in the community and in the county, but to have them think outside Side of the box because you can't just have uh, this is this is a benefit and we need to sell some paintings to support these environmental groups and you can't just have like scary paintings uh, you know <laughs> we're basically a, a landscape artist and so uh, we I've just started a promotional uh, 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 call out to have them send in some of their ideas and to think outside the box and we're starting to get some abstracts, which is showing, you have it showing there, thank yeah. you. That, that's our first one, uh, which is uh, called Elemental Unrest. And I, we also got some related to Spire. And I put in a lot of local issues that have happened um, that people could relate to, the migration of the butterflies and uh, the turbines, uh, taking out the risky oil and gas. Uh, projects so that they could become a little educated and think a little bit further how they could relate their art to what's going on locally here and and you know worldwide but mostly I've tried to connect them to local issues and to have their mediums be something that they can stretch themselves so that we can actually sell beautiful paintings and they'll all be beautiful of course but yes, meaningful that, too yeah that's 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 the direction that we've been Wonderful. Yeah. 
Well, thank you so much for all the work that you're already doing. I know this is a, it's a big lift, but it takes a long time and we are, we are very excited to be part of it and to be partnering with these other great groups. So, um, and you will be hearing more from us and from SCAPE um, in, the, in the next few months as, as this comes together. So thank you. thank you, thank you, Bonnie, so much. I think we might have time for, uh, uh, we've had such a rich discussion, we've sort of run out of question time. Are there any questions, um, Iris, that should I look at in the Q&A? Um, see if there's anything um, that people are asking that we can respond to really quick. Um, somebody's asking a really interesting question. Um, they're anonymous, so I can't, um, I can't give them give their name out um how can we use art like nurture our mother which is the name of the mural um to help make policy change for climate action within our community so so you have any quick thoughts about how you know referring to the mural or using the mural as inspiration for um changes that people would like to see locally anyone want to take that on Um, I think for me personally, just anything in terms of environmental justice, I always look to listening to the Native community and, and their leaders. Um, and so I think the way we use art, you know, it, it's definitely a tool for awareness and for spreading information, but there always has to be an action after it for it to be considered activist art. And I think for me, it's always been, you know, going into the communities and be, be more than just an ally, really going in there, protecting, helping um, nurture nurture the land and, and finding how we can connect with each other to make sure that, you know, these policies are in place or that actions are being taken care of because I never want my work to just be decorations on the wall. I want them to get something moving. Um, but I would definitely say I, at least for environmental justice, I've always, you know, um, looked to the indigenous community um, in, in showing how I can support them um, just because they've been definitely the ones protecting a lot of the land and water. I'm just thinking about like the Dakota Access Pipeline and San Marcos Full Hills, how they're literally putting their body on the line to protect the environment. And um, we definitely need to listen and follow them and support them. Yeah, that's sums it up beautifully. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone wanting to add to that? Or I think that's a, a perfect note to, to close out on. Wow. Thank you so much for it. And also for the, the passion that you and, and everyone else is, is bringing to this. It's greatly, greatly appreciated. So thank you all again. Um, I'm going to start our little bit of wrap up kind of closing credits section here because we're um, coming up on the end of the hour. So um, I just want to thank you all again there for tuning in to this episode of the CEC webinar series. We're going to have two more poll questions for you pop up on your screen um, in the next few moments. And, and your responses will really help guide future topics. So thank you in advance for taking a moment to answer those. Um, thank you again to Alex and Sarah from the Museum of Contemporary Art Santa Barbara, Stacy from the Wildling Museum of Art and Nature, um, artist Adriana Arriaga and Claudia Borfiga, and also Bonnie Freeman from SCAPE. Thank you all. Um, our next webinar is July 20th at noon, and we'll focus on how we move toward a circular economy. Um, we have another stellar lineup of guests for you for that one. Um, we wanna thank our sponsors today who have helped us put this webinar on, which is Cox Communications, Marburg Industries, and Maps.com. Um, you will receive a follow-up email in the next few days with a link to the recording and other resources. Um, so in case you want to share it with anyone, please do that. Um, and I want to let you know that free events like this are just one of the ways that we at CEC work to advance rapid and equitable solutions to the climate crisis. Um, and CEC is one of only five nonprofits in Santa Barbara County to hold the highest ratings possible on both Charity Navigator and GuideStar. You can support our critical work by texting GIVE to 805-600-3360 or visit cecsb.org forward slash GIVE. Thank you again so much for joining us and we look forward to connecting with you again soon. Have a great day.